Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming on this uh, not so beautiful day, not so beautiful afternoon, but we'll be warm and cozy here. Uh, I'm Nick Freudenberg. I uh, teach public health here at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy. And I'm also the director of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, which is the co-sponsor of this grand rounds with the School of Public Health. And we're very happy to have you all here. Our speaker this afternoon is uh, a longtime friend and colleague, Lori Dorfman. Uh, Lori trained in public health at the University of California, Berkeley, and for the last uh, long time has been director of the Berkeley Media Studies Group. This is an independent organization that looks at newspaper coverage of health, health advocacy, uh, and the role of the media and advocates in shaping uh, health policy and health equity. Uh, her group has worked on many, many health issues, and today we're going to hear about some of their work on one issue, which is counter-marketing uh, of unhealthy food to children of color. We're very happy to have you here, and welcome. Thank you, Nick. Thank you to the CUNY community for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to open my water. Last time I gave a public lecture, I spilled my water all over my notes. I couldn't read a single thing. And then a couple minutes later, I did it again. And, the, and at the end of the lecture, a nice man sidled up to me at the end and said, you know, if you put the cap on, that won't happen. So we're all about prevention here in public health, so I'm going to do that. So um, can, can you all hear me okay? Yes. I need positive reinforcement. Yes, Lori, we can hear you. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. And um, let's get started. And I'm going to start by um, answering a question that my good friend Marion Nestle posed to me as we were sitting on the in waiting for the introduction from Nick. And that is that she said, I really need to update my slides with today's date. So I'm going to explain to you why they say September 2018, and it's really part of our overall strategy that I or experts from the university or wherever aren't the only people talking about this issue. Food marketing, as I hope I will convince you by the end of this, is really a scourge that we need to do something about, particularly as it targets kids of color in our community. And so I want to encourage you to be able to say the same thing. So the slides I'm about to give you, with the exception of two that I sneaked in there, um, you can download as is from our website, along with the script so you know what to say with them, because this is something we should all be talking about and we should all be talking about more frequently. So we put together these slides for the field in September of 2018, and you'll get a link to them if you are interested, and I hope you will take them and adapt them to your local needs, and I hope they'll be useful to you. So that's why, Marianne, it says 2018. So, so let's get started on this. Um, so the, the reason we're here, the reason we're having this conversation is because all kids deserve health. From the very start, every kid needs to be healthy, and it's our responsibility to create that society so that they can grow up healthy in that society. And one obstacle we are facing is the marketing that is luring them and enticing them to eat the things that they should avoid, that they should eat less of. So we want to do something about that, and we especially want to do that about the target marketing to kids of color. Right now, 84% of the food and drink that is advertised on Spanish TV is for unhealthy products. Black children see more than twice as many ads for sugary drinks. So it's no wonder we've got this problem. So what we're going to do is take a look at what this looks like, what does the marketing look like, and then talk about what we can, what we can do about it. So how are marketers doing this? Um, so let's see. We want to 
examine how it works. So the first way that companies lure kids is by creating a market with kids products. You know, it used to be that the only product that was targeting kids in particular was cereal boxes just sugary cereals. And I've heard Michael Jacobson, the former director of the Center for Science and the Public Interest, who I'm sure many of you know, say that the advertising for kids at that point was just on the reverse of the cereal box. You just had to read it and then send away for your secret decoder. And that was it. And that has really changed. Lunchables is just one example of products that are designed just for kids. And the, unfortunately, according to the Rudd Center, five, just five out of the 42 different varieties of Lunchables meet the food industry's own standards for nutrition and advertising for kids. So, so this is, that's the bad news. This happened in about in the late 1990s. If you've read Food Politics by Mary Nestle, you will be apprised of this at, or the Institute of Medicine's report, which showed that in 1994, there were about 50 products that were designed just for kids. And in 2004, 10 years later, there were about 500 that were designed just for kids. So we've got a problem and a growing problem. And the, the companies aren't straight with us about what they're doing. So um, this is what the sugar frosted flakes box looked like in when it first came out in 1983, the sugar frosted flakes just took the word sugar off the front, but they didn't take the sugar out of the cereal. So, so we've got a big problem here. So companies are designing products that are just for kids. They're also in all the places that kids are. And you might not think of a vending machine in a school as marketing, but it is because it has the brand on it and it's placing it right where kids are. Um, they are also marketing everywhere kids are online. So we have a digital game changer now. What we have is a world where kids are now looking at screens all the time, as we all are pretty much. I shouldn't just put this on kids. It means that the marketers are also looking at us 24 seven because they're tracking what we look at, how long we look at it, where we go online and they collect that data. They collect the data in the physical world about where we are using GPS technology and they can be very personalized then about what it is they show us and what they show me might not be what they show my nephew who's in high school or what they show my parents at home because it's all individualized at this point. Um, and it's influential. So the research shows that kids respond to this and the, um, the enticement of it is impossible to, to counter. And it's also not even recognizable as advertising. So I'm going to show you one example. We're going to start with a little video from McDonald's. And the reason we have this video is because McDonald's entered it into a competition. You know, we've heard of the Cannes Film Festival in France. Well, there's also a specialized commercial Cannes Film Festival as well, where they, where marketers show their best product. And I was talking about this and showing it to a colleague of mine who was in tobacco control, who was aghast that you could never imagine the tobacco company entering an ad campaign into a contest to show how well they attract kids, yet food companies aren't afraid to do that. So this is award-winning advertising and it's about Snapchat. So some of you may know about Snapchat. It's the most I can tell you is it's on your phone, <laughs> but we're gonna see a little video about it and then um, I can tell you a little bit more. So let's see if I can make this happen in this wide, wide world of technology. McDonald's doesn't just talk digital, we do digital. And 2015 turned out to be one hell of a year. Let's talk Snapchat. We made headlines by being the first brand ever to create geo filters at scale. That's 14,000 plus McDonald's locations full of customers sharing snaps with our messages to their network of friends. So far, that's six campaigns and 308 million views. We plan on being the first and being the best wherever our customers are spending their time. We make big things happen. Okay, so this my favorite line from that little uh, that little brag that McDonald's is doing about how well they've attracted kids' eyeballs. 
my favorite line is um, that McDonald's is getting our messages to their network of friends. So these are images that go from kid to kid, from teenager to teenager, from young person to young person, and they're not labeled as advertising, they're not recognized as advertising, they're just kind of inculcated into their regular life and the digital media that they're consuming a lot of. And the, the way the industry talks about this, they call the kids brand ambassadors. So if there are any kinds of filters that young people have for advertising, they, they drop completely. It's because it's coming from friend to friend rather than from company to consumer. So that's challenging. That's really challenging. I'm going to show you uh, another one that's, um, that's equally challenging, actually makes, makes our life even more difficult if we were trying to protect the public's health. The one I'm going to show you now is called, it's from a show on YouTube, it's called EvanTube HD. It's one of the most successful programs and it's an example of very successful junk food promotion. It's, this is what's known as influencer marketing and people have probably heard that term influencer. So this is how it works. Um, there are now firms, by the way, that, that represent the influencers for companies so they can make deals. Um, and a complaint was filed to the um, Federal Trade Commission because of violations that the Center for Digital Democracy and some of their colleagues sought in violating the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. It's the only federal law we have about privacy in the United States. And it says that companies cannot collect data on kids under 13. And YouTube was found in violation of this and was just levied a $170 million fine by the Federal Trade Commission, the biggest in its history. So, so people are trying to do something about this and I'm going to show you what it is and show you what concerns me about it. Um, it's a long video, we'll only watch a little bit of it. You said whoever wins. No, 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 no. Can you hear that out there? Can you turn it up? Can you raise the volume please? Oh, I raise the volume? To HD, and today we're back with another food challenge. We're doing a Pringles potato chip challenge. Um, let, let me, uh... Three flavors of Pringles. We have well, you'll get some flavors here. and guess what flavors they are. We have no idea what the flavors are, so we're probably going to get Thank a bunch you. of them wrong. I hope there aren't any bad ones. It doesn't matter because I love potato chips. Okay, well, ladies first. Sounds a little off, okay. sorry. Here is chip number one. Where is it? Barbecue? Mm. It's good. I think it's cheddar. Okay, here is chip number two. It's kind of spicy. Hot pepper. Actually, this one tastes more like a... Okay, here is chip number three. Popcorn. Give me the ball. <coughs> okay, so speak of the idea here, right? It's it's adorable, isn't it? They're adorable. You can't you can't get around that. But here's what worries me about this. This thing goes on for 18 minutes. It has had more than 27 million views. And there are many, many, many of these. Um, and that's the 18 minutes. There's Oreos, there's ice cream, there's all kinds of things kids should avoid. So the research that we have that shows that advertising has an effect on kids really comes from old school media. It comes from television. And when kids were getting ads from television, they were 30 seconds at a time embedded in other programming. And that had an effect, according to the Institute of Medicine, on what kids' preferences are and what they choose to eat and ultimately their health. So if 30 seconds in a cartoon has that effect on what kids ultimately eat. I'm really worried about 18 solid minutes that kids are actively engaged in. So this is, this is troublesome. This is troublesome. So, um, so now what we want to do is 
figure out uh, why this matters. And the reason it matters is because we know that it works. Um, the, and well, before I get to this one, uh, I just want you to know that the, um, it's hard to measure this stuff. And as I said, most of the research was about television. And sometimes I wonder, you know, it just seems so natural and normal. It's part of the water we swim in, all this advertising. And then I saw something that really confirmed to me that, it, that we're on the right track when we're trying to do something about food marketing to kids. And it was something that was um, leaked with all the WikiLeaks stuff. Remember the WikiLeaks stuff? That, not, uh, Lori, I need more uh, affirmation. Okay, yes, Lori, remember, thank you. Okay, okay, so when, there was this one thing that came out with WikiLeaks, and it, it was a strategy document from Coca-Cola in the European Union. So the, here it is. So I'm going to show you, explain to you what's, what's here. So you see a graph, they're assessing their risk. It says at the top, public policy risk matrix and lobby focus. Coca-Cola EU is trying to figure out where are they going to focus their lobbying dollars, okay? So you see on one axis, the y-axis, it's business impact. So what's going to hurt Coca-Cola's business the most? And then the y-axis across the bottom is what's likely to happen. So what's going to hurt our business and what's likely to happen? If it's, going to, if it's in the upper right-hand quadrant, if it's really going to have a big business impact and it's very likely to happen, we want to fight back. And that's what it says in the background. If it's going to hurt our business, um, but we don't really think it's likely to happen, then we're going to prepare for that. Um, and if it's not going to hurt our business and it's not likely to materialize it, even though it's out there, we'll just monitor it. So this chart got a lot of attention among advocates who are concerned about sugary beverages and interested in soda taxes because the top thing that the industry thinks is going to happen and is going to have a very strong impact on their business is taxing sugary beverages. That's the one I just circled. So that's what the flutter was about when this came out. Everybody was talking about excise taxes, which are a good thing if you want to lower consumption or if you want to raise money for prevention. But then when you start reading the chart more carefully, you see a couple of other things that they're very concerned about because they think it will hurt Coca-Cola's business. Advertising restrictions for sweet beverages, advertising restrictions for high fat and sugary and salty foods, plain packaging for unhealthy foods, a ban of advertising for children older than 12, an EU definition of children as over 12 years old, and discriminatory nutrition labeling schemes. I don't think we would call them discriminatory. We would just call them labeling schemes. So this was an affirmation to me that, gee, maybe we are on the right track looking at the marketing. If Coca-Cola thinks that doing something about it will harm their business, I think the flip side of that is that it will protect the public's health and the kids we care about most, the kids who are suffering most from the problem. So um, on the very bottom is uh, something they don't think will harm their business, and that is banning advertising to children under 12. Now, of course, that's more politically um, salient, perhaps, but it's not going to have the biggest effect that we want. So this is an important thing to do, and it's especially important to do to the kids who are the hardest hit by this. African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans are twice as likely to be suffering from diabetes and other nutrition-related diseases, and we have to do something about that, and it starts with childhood. So that's what brings us here to thinking about the targeting of kids of color. And so the first question is, well, why? Why are children of color being targeted? And the, the first reason why is because they are a rapidly increasing market. They're growing faster than the market of white kids and companies look for growing markets. That's why we had the explosion in the, at the turn of the century of uh, products marketed just for kids. So they, the industry themselves, when you read the industry literature, they say this is a, what a research group that was backed by McDonald's, Kraft, PepsiCo, Burger King, and others, they called Hispanics the most important U.S. demographic growth driver in the food, beverage, and restaurant sectors. It's kind of like, um, oh, who's the guy that uh, was asked, you know, why do you rob banks? Oh, I 
can't think of it. Say it again. Willie Sutton, yeah, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is? Okay, so this is, that's why they're targeting the market that's growing the fastest. All right. The marketers are targeting the, that market because of its increasing economic impact. By 2020, spending power in the Latino community will be 1.5 trillion. In the African American community, it will be 1.4 trillion. It's where the money is. That's why they're gonna market there. Um, they also market to kids of color because they are trendsetters for white kids. Here again is a quote from the industry. This is Yolanda White, Assistant Vice President of African American Marketing for Coca-Cola. She says, Afri African American teens in particular have proven to be trendsetters in the US. Their ability to shape culture is really critical. So that's why they're going there. So there's a lot of reasons. The other reason is that they consume a lot of media. And if you add up the hours spent because people are on more than one screen at a time and kids of color take up uh, especially mobile media faster than white kids, they are consuming eight to 13 hours of media within six to 10 hours. So you can really think of this as a bombardment. All right, so how do the junk food companies reach kids of color? They reach them by designing products that are designed for their taste at prices that they can afford depending on the neighborhood or sometimes depending on the individual person because you can get marketed a price specifically to your phone. That's why I keep going like this. I'm holding my invisible phone. Um, in different places where kids are and promoting in a language that they understand and I don't don't just mean English Spanish or other kind of language like that but the language of kind of being a kid so uh, McDonald's had the fiesta menu that was an early example of product marketing the dollar menu is an example of how prices shift and how they're targeting certain populations place can be really an interesting way to think about marketing because it's not just the physical place where you are but the cultural place where you are so this is an example of coca-cola sponsoring the essence festival every time a company sponsors sports or entertainment events they want to be in the place psychologically as well as physically that kids are and then the promotion is using the language of kids and i really do want those twinkies with the green cream inside. Mm -hmm. So anyway, there you go. So that's, that is the, those are all the techniques. I think the the newest one really is, is personalization. So those four things I mentioned before, product, price, place, promotion, that is, that's standard target marketing. That's what you think about when you're marketing things. And as public health people, we can think about the reverse of that. We can think about what are the policies that we can point to the products that aren't healthy? What are the policies that can arrest the price that makes junk food much cheaper than healthy foods? And that's what an excise tax on soda does. What places do we have control of? And what can we say is permitted inside those places and not in other places? And what kind of promotions do we think are fair and unfair? And personalization is the latest one. And so I think it's kind of the trickiest one because we don't know as much about it and the companies are moving very rapidly to take advantage of it and collect the data on all the places we go and the way we click and how we use our media so that they can be very, very specific when they target me individually with an ad. When when I or anyone else is on a website, for example, in between that microsecond, when what you've clicked on to look at at the website comes up and everything else you notice, of course, the ads usually show up first, but that split second and what, what has happened in that split, split second is that companies, food companies and other companies have bid at auction for your eyeballs for that split second and it happens that fast. So this stuff is very, very hard to counter. Um, the, uh, the price is also a very um, uh, tricky thing. This is, we had to put this in this slide in the deck because of a report that came out from the First Nation Institute that found that foods like milk, eggs, bread, beef, apples, and tomatoes cost more on Indian reservations, while Cheetos cost less than elsewhere in the country. So even though it's easy to point to urban centers like we're in and the saturation of marketing, it's everywhere. 
the uh, Denisa Livingston and uh, Nate, um, who's from the Navajo Nation sent me this picture. She said that it was uh, polluting the landscape of her homeland and the Navajo Nation. So this, this is all around us and kids, as we said, are saturated with it. So the Rudd Center found that for um, African Americans, kids were exposed to more McDonald's ads, Kellogg's, Pop-Tarts, Tyson frozen entrees and PepsiCo and Gatorade, and that on Spanish language TV, McDonald's, Mars, Twix, Cinnamon Toast Crunch, Orbit uh, Gum, these are the products that kids are seeing, kids of color are seeing more than their white counterparts. Okay, so I hope I've established that we have a problem here that we have to do something about. And I don't think it's an easy thing to do something about. I think it's gonna take a lot of thinking and a lot of noise and um, a lot of demands. And and that has happened before. These are these are tough things to fight, but, but it has happened before. So one place we've seen it happen before is with tobacco. And we've seen specific target marketing of tobacco. Um, menthol has been targeted. Here's an example from cool for African at African Americans for a really long time. Um, first in an old ad like this with cool cigarettes later on with uh, a hip hop version of Joe Camel that was targeting African Americans. And up until the master settlement agreement, there were billboards there used to in, uh, in, na in neighborhoods that were targeted as well as free cigarette giveaways and things like that just like we might now now have with food and people tried to do something about it and are still trying to do something about it um, they said stop in and, and we've seen good examples of this in Philadelphia a coalition stopped RJ Reynolds from marketing a brand new menthol cigarette to African Americans that was going to be called Uptown named after the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia it was the Uptown Out of Town Coalition and it was a coalition of African American smokers and non-smokers that said we don't care if this is a normal business practice to target, uh, try out a new product on us. We don't want it. And they successfully got rid of it, which is why you don't hear about uptown cigarettes. In San Francisco recently, an ordinance was passed to get rid of flavored tobacco, including menthol. And of course, ever since the FDA took control of tobacco and nicotine, we've been trying to get them to get rid of menthol. So it's, it's this is a long-term battle and difficult, but, but it can be done. So how do you combat it? First, I think we have to support the voices of the people who are targeted directly and find ways for young people to engage in this deliberate attack on their health. And there are groups that are doing that. Some of them are right here in your own backyard. Um, I think uh, we also have to encourage the companies to do better. You know, if they want to have a promotion for that ties into some new movie, why did they? Why do they have to choose their worst food? Why don't they choose the best food? If their advertising is that good, why aren't they putting it on the products that kids should have more of instead of the products kids should have less? The other thing we can do is educate policymakers, and they need a lot of education about this. The um, FTC ruling that I just told you about was years in the making, and the violations were very severe. And the educate and the complaint, which anybody can download to the FTC, really documents very clearly what the violations were, what the influencer marketing is, and how the data collection was happening on kids that shouldn't be happening. So we have to do our homework and we have to do it well. We have to share it with people and educate. And so here's an example. Um, this is two examples of teens themselves taking control of the dialogue. One is the bigger picture. I encourage you to look it up. It is a collaboration between youth Speaks, which is an art and poetry group. They call it spoken word, but you know I call it poetry. So that because I'm old, poetry and they they joined up with uh, the University of California at San Francisco and they created videos that really explain what's going on, not just with marketing, but with all aspects of marketing, the kinds of products that are made, how their culture is being appropriated, what that means, what that means to them personally. They're very powerful. They're using it to educate young people in California and elsewhere. Get Hype Philly is an activist group that is sponsored by the Food Trust in Philadelphia, where kids are not only learning about what the marketing is and what it means to them and how it harms their health, but they're taking it directly themselves 
themselves to their local legislators and asking them to do something about it. And I think uh, right here you have a lovely model of the counter marketing hub where young people have been saying, well, wait a minute, let's say the truth about what's behind these ads and what's really happening. So if you don't know, these are images that come right here from, from CUNY. So you should get behind this, help them do it more and help them figure out how to get it, not just to other young people, which is a good thing, but also to the people who govern whether this is okay or not. Um, the, uh, there are parents groups that are working to change things. One is Moms Rising. Moms Rising has a junk food, um, they create a comic book for moms. It's called Secret Agent Moms to help them figure out ways they can get active in their schools and in their local neighborhoods to protect their kids really upstream, not after they're noticing their kids are full of, uh, are getting all these ads and all the different marketing, but what can they do ahead of time and how can they do it together? So Moms Rising is just an example of one organization that people can join anywhere in the country to do something about uh, junk food marketing to kids. There's also Corporate Accountability International, which is challenging things like McDonald's McTeachers Night, which is a, is a time when the teachers get behind the counter and all the families go to McDonald's to, um, because some of the dollars will go to the school that the teacher is from. And so that's a fun, exciting thing to do. But if McDonald's really cares about kids' health, I think they could be doing things that are much more profound and would make a much bigger difference. So Corporate Accountability International is, is challenging them on that. There are also people who are working on the digital side. We are among a group of folks trying to do something about that marketing that comes directly to people's phones. Color of Change, an online civil rights organization, and Unidos US, another civil rights organization, formerly the National Council of La Raza, are working with BMSG, my organization, and the Center for Digital Democracy to bring to the attention of legislators and policymakers at the Federal Trade Commission and, and other agencies the problems with the digital marketing we're seeing that they have jurisdiction over. And there's lots of people doing research as well. The Council on Black Health in Philadelphia as well as Salute America in Texas and the Yukon Rudd Center in Connecticut are also doing the research that is helping document what the problem is. The Rudd Center today just came out with a new report updating their research on how soda and sugary drinks are targeted to kids and found again disproportionate marketing for drinks with added sugar and also um, diet drinks to kids of color. So the, it's important to support the research, to use the research and to bring it to people who can do something about it. And one place where you can join with others who want to do something about it is at foodmarketing.org. This is the website of the Food Marketing Work Group, which is co-chaired by the Center for Science and Public Interest and BMSG. It's a uh, coalition of about 200 organizations that are taking on different aspects of food marketing and trying to make a change so that the environment kids are born into, grow up in, and eventually raise their own families in will be healthier than the ones they started in. So. I will stop there and be eager for your thoughts and questions. Questions, comments? There's some over here, Nick. Okay. Yeah. Hello, thank you for coming can, today. Can you tell me who you are? I am Samara, a CUNY student. Uh, health policy management track. I noticed the advertisement, as you said, about um, in between televisions. I don't know when it happened for me, um, but I noticed what triggers or what stands out to me mostly is when advertising of color is happening. And McDonald's especially started doing that in the early 2000s or so, where they brought hip hop and um, people of color with Afro hair into their commercials that wasn't there because in the time of marketing, it wasn't so, so popular to see African-Americans on TV or in advertisements that, as right. much. And McDonald's definitely marketed on that and they were on it to make everything more urban for um, the city communities. I don't know what's advertising non-city communities because right. I noticed there is a difference in that. So I, I thank you for bringing that up in the slides because it is noticeable to um, people of color and you see it out there and um, kids, I don't know how kids are 
reacting to the ad ads now. There's always songs that get them interested in there, and I, I want to thank you for mentioning that. But what are some things you think um, parents can do to stop some some type of marketing, if that? Is there certain channels that they should try to avoid or limit? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's a great question, and it's a, it's a place where people often go because, of course, parents are responsible for kids. I think we have to be really careful, though, because I think it's not fair to hold parents responsible for the marketing and the marketing dollars that are an onslaught for them. So I think parents need help with that, and that the best thing that parents can do is join with other parents who want to take a stand and do something about the marketing that they see. I don't, the marketing is so pervasive that it's very, very hard to avoid. Even if you're online, you know, there are, um, there's YouTube and then there's kids YouTube. Like most kids eyeballs these days are on YouTube. So that's, if you're a marketer and you wanna get kids, that's where you go. They tried to carve out a space that was safe for kids and they called it Kids YouTube, I think is what it's called. It's it's um, maybe more safe, but it's not perfect. And in fact, kids are watching regular YouTube. So I think parents need to join with others to demand that the food and food and beverage marketing not be shown on YouTube at all. If if they they can if since they know so much about us, they know the age of the person watching. So they could age gate what it's called. You could prevent a food or beverage advertisement from showing up on a screen that is being viewed by somebody under a certain age. And I think making that kind of demand in concert with others would have the biggest effect. I think parents can also educate their kids. I bet, so we're not eliminating that, but I, I'm, I'm worried that it won't be enough. That was a uh, fantastic presentation, uh, by the way. I can't wait to download it myself and uh, share it with some organizations that I've worked at and have um, ties with. Good, so, tell me who you are. Oh, my name is William Robinson. I am an MPH graduate uh, alumni uh, here. Um, and I, I've been here prominently, I would say, over the years. And I just wanted to know in my, in my research, how would you explain two things? First, what is it that we're going to do to be able to get into the child's and children's psyches that are not able to tell good marketing from false marketing? They just consider everything as truth. That's why uh, cartoon characters are so effective. And also they're protected under free speech too. And the second proposal that I have, and I've been mulling over, has anyone ever considered altering the nutritional facts labels to be customized to an adult version as well as one meant for kids, potentially. Okay. And that's my idea. I own that one. Okay. Um, Congratulations. Um, I'll start with that one. I have no idea if anybody's ever tried to do that. I'd say that it's, I don't, I've never heard of it. I think it's been really hard to get the one for adults to be something adults can understand. So it's, uh, so good luck with that. Um, the second one um, about, helping kids understand good advertising from bad advertising. Here's the problem. It's not, that's not really the question. It has to do with brain development. There is just a certain amount of time it takes us human beings to develop our brain in ways that can discern certain differences. And it's not until really teenage years, like 12 and older, where kids really get an understanding of what that advertising is being put out there by somebody who, with something to sell. It's kind of mushy exactly when in teenage land that happens, but it definitely doesn't happen for kids. The way uh, researcher Dale Kunkel explained it to me, and he was on the original IOM committee, he said it's like this, and he's a psychologist. He said, who studies media and how kids respond. He, what he said is, it's like when we read, if any of us pick up the New York Times, if, I hope you all are still picking up the New York Times, but if anybody's picking up the New York Times and you read it, you take that in that information very differently than when you pass a billboard and take the information in that way. You, you don't say brain, look at that billboard differently. You just, you know how 
you you your brain just allows that information in differently because of what you've learned culturally over your lifetime. For a kid, there's no difference. Everything comes in like the New York Times. So the idea that you could use media literacy for really young kids, I think is is not it's not going to be helpful. You might use media literacy for older kids, but it's really not until much later than was earlier thought that brains are fully developed. We don't have our complete executive function as it's called that that part of our brain that tells us what's what and what to do next and has that kind of control until the mid 20s. So I think that we've got a developmental issue here that really means the responsibility needs to be on the companies to respect that and not expect kids or even their parents to do something that's not possible. I'm, I'm Al Mohandas, I'm the Dean of the School. Um, two things, first of all, surrounded by the current political milieu, I will tell you that unfortunately skepticism is not uh, protective of even adults uh, from misinformation. Yes. Um, but having putting that aside, I, I'm a little bit disturbed that most of what I hear and what I'm experiencing is the concept of blocking misinformation or blocking uh, targeted advertisement as opposed to uh, successful communication to children and adults about healthy eating and healthy living. I do understand that industry does have the resources to spend but I must admit that uh, I'm a little bit, I feel like this is a limiting strategy if it is not counteracted with a strong effort and an investment towards healthy communication about healthy behaviors. And the question is, who's going to own this? Mm -hmm. And how can we disseminate it successfully uh, instead of always feeling defeated by industry as the only perspective. Mm -hmm. So a couple things. Um, the first thing is that there are advertisements, there is marketing for healthy food, just not very much of it. And even when it's been studied on television, kids of color see less of that. So if the general public sees two to three percent of that. African American kids on television, for example, see one percent or less. So even there we have a disparity. But I completely appreciate the impulse that can't we counter this with helping people understand what's better to eat and don't we have a responsibility in public health and in nutrition to educate people about what is better to eat and of course we do. But we can't take out, we can't uh, disengage the discussion about information from all the other parts of the world that people are living in. So the, even if you know what's right to feed your family, if you can't get access to the grocery store because you had to work a second job and the bus route doesn't go by in a way that allows you to take more than one bag at a time and the kids have to do their homework and get uh, and need help with that, it's going to be uh, real strain to do what you were taught in whatever nutrition class or what, whatever good program CUNY had to help people do a better job with that. So we have, you have to place it in a larger societal context. But I can tell you that there are places where it's happening. It's just not unrelated to the way people are organizing at the community level and thinking about um, what they want to promote more of and what they want less of. So I'll give you an example. I'm my office is in Berkeley, California, the home of the first municipal soda tax in the nation. That soda tax passed with 76% of the vote. The reason it passed with such a high vote is because of the coalition that came together to pass it that was made up of people not only from the university, not only from academia, not only from professional public health, but also from the community who didn't need to be told that they were dying faster from diabetes. So you had a coalition where power was shared that went from door to door. People always worry about message. What, 
what's our message? What should we say? It was a health message. People understood it. Okay, so that was a huge win. But what has happened since will warm your heart, I think, because what happened was a commission was formed as part of the legislation to direct where that money should go. And where is it going? Every school in the city of Berkeley has a community, has a garden. What happens at that garden? Children learn. They learn a little bit of math. They learn a little bit of other things, but they also learn how to grow vegetables and how to cook them and how to eat them. That money has gone to a group called Healthy Black Families that is doing exactly the kind of nutrition education you're talking about. At the same time, they are empowering women to take control over the food that they eat and feed their children, they're also empowering them to be advocates in the community to keep going. So I think that it's possible, but I don't think, I think that in that, at least in Berkeley, the conversation about the predatory marketing has been part of what has motivated people to want to get the education. I beseech you to add a few slides about these last comments you have made. Okay. Well, actually, I'll tell you what, there are right now a couple of outstanding standing videos, very short videos that describe it. I'll send them out to you so you can put the links with this when it goes out because what's important about that is a lot of the attention around soda taxes in particular go to making them happen. There's not much knowledge about what happens with the money afterwards. And of course, the soda industry accused the city of Berkeley of taking that money and running with it when in fact it's been put into exactly the kind of uh, corrective measures we need for for creating healthy nutrition environments. I have uh, a few sort of follow-up questions and uh, comments. It seems to me, I mean, that the goal of public health policy is both to provide information, but also to make healthy choices, easy choices. And the question is, how do you do that? And how do you do that in this circumstance? And what's the balance. And kind of in thinking along those lines, I wanted to ask your thoughts on two strategies, one of which you just started to talk about. What do you think are the connections between uh, sugary beverage taxes, as you showed, clearly the uh, big fear of uh, food companies, and uh, restrictions on marketing? How are those, how are those things connected, and how could they be connected? And then the second uh, strategy I wanted to ask you about. Uh, in the early years of tobacco control, the uh, Federal Communications Commission had something called the Fairness Doctrine mm -hmm. that required television stations owned by the public to give equal time to controversial issues. And that was interpreted for a brief few years by the federal government uh, to mean that if a television station uh, advertised tobacco, they had to give equal time to anti-tobacco groups. And those anti-tobacco ads on mainstream media were so effective in uh, reducing demands that the television, that the tobacco industry voluntarily said, we're not going to advertise on TV anymore. So I just wonder yeah. what you think about that. I think we need the fair, fairness doctrine back is what I think about that. And I think that was, uh, um, I think it was a marvelous strategy and it really showed the power of the marketing and the power of the industry, the tobacco industry in that case, to, to shut off that uh, information. So clearly the information makes a difference. Um, Nick, remind me, what was your first question? Uh, the connection between oh, the taxes, uh, taxes and, 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 marketing? and marketing, predatory marketing. Um, one connection is that the predatory marketing that people people feel it, they know it. Like you said, people see themselves and they know that, you know, this isn't rocket science. They know that sugary beverages probably aren't the best thing for you, right? Even though um, they're a treat or, or whatever. So um, so I think that it, it helps people recognize what they already see and, and that's a useful thing. It was certainly a useful thing in the soda campaigns and the conversations in Berkeley. The thing that you made me think of, um, I don't know if this is what you were looking for, but what you made me think of is that right now, because marketing is a standard business practice, practice um, the expense of that gets written off by the corporation. So in, in some ways, you can think of that as us as taxpayers subsidizing companies for the marketing they're doing that harms our communities. So 
um, Representative, Representative DeLauro has had a bill periodically to do something about that and to take some of those uh, monies and, and try to put them to public health. It's a, that would be a very long-term struggle, but I think it, it's an important issue to raise because I think people don't think about it. Um, I, and I think we need, there's more thinking we have to do. I wish I had a smarter answer for you, but um, I'm not really sure. Just the one other thought is, is money. That, um, yeah. that soda taxes are a revenue stream yes. used in the ways you described in Berkeley. In right. Philadelphia, it's used to uh, pay for childcare, right. make childcare available to everybody. Right. And again, the tobacco analogy is the master settlement agreement right. provided uh, billions of dollars uh, some of which was then uh, uh, sifted away, right. but was used to counter the advertising of the tobacco industry. That's right. The uh, counter marketing that we and other groups have done has not been able to go to scale the way the truth campaign was because right. they had the hundreds of millions of dollars from right. the tobacco settlement. Well, and before the tobacco settlement was attorneys general who were suing the industry to re recompense the cost that tobacco had put on their states for all the disease it caused that the states had to pay for. So maybe what we need here is an attorney's general strategy and start talking about the direct harms to communities and maybe what could be recovered by suing the, the industry and the companies themselves. And that's what led to the master settlement agreement. So maybe we um, need to meet with some of those tobacco folks and see what's viable here. There is a, there is a lawsuit right now going on where uh, certain parties are suing Coca-Cola for its marketing. And so I think watching that would be really useful and seeing where that goes. Other questions? And there's a couple over here too. I think also- um, Tell me who you are. Vanessa. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, I'm a student here. Um, the access that you were talking about, um, I live in East Harlem, so there's a McDonald's basically on 125th Street, on 107th Street, it just keeps on going. So how can we basically stop business developers from coming into our communities? Mm -hmm. And so, so kids can have that access because there's so many schools around here as well. Right, you know, what's nice about that is that there are um, land use policies that communities can set about what's permissible and not permissible. And there might be some investigation that students from CUNY could do about what the over concentration of outlets for fast food or even alcohol or things like that are within a, a certain block and then start to talk to some of your local legislators about what are the municipal ways we can dictate how our land is used and for what purpose. And there's a lot of opportunity thinking about land use law. Hi, my name is Sharita James and I work here within the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. I actually oversee our council marketing work um, and I'm also a dietetic intern here at the School of Public Health. Um, what's very interesting to me is that there's a genre of videos on YouTube called mukbangs. Are you familiar I with those? I am. And so for those of you who don't know, it's when people eat large amounts of foods in front of the camera and kind of like broadcast their eating um, to other people. And typically it's junky food, like a whole bunch of Taco Bell, McDonald's, et cetera. And, you know, I find myself watching these videos sometimes and, and getting hungry and craving the food. And I'm like, wow, this is a very subtle marketing strategy. And some of these people are actually endorsed by these companies to eat these foods. So right. should YouTube be held responsible for these videos? Should there be a limit, a limit on the amount of videos that are shown um, regarding mukbangs? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I have a, a niece who is a vegan mukbanger, which is how I learned about it. I don't know if that's a word. Um, you know, at at minimum, I think it's a big question you're asking and it's a complex complex question. And it would be interesting to read the, the complaint that just went to the FTC and, and think about it with that in mind. I would say at minimum, based on rulings the Federal Trade Commission has already made, that at minimum, it should be disclosed as advertising when the companies are paying for it. And so I would start there, but it might be worth exploring other options as well. Uh, 
Um, hi, my name is Megan. Um, I'm a first semester student here at CUNY School of Public Health. Um, and I guess my question to you is, I had an interesting experience the other day with an Uber driver who's from East New York, he's black, and I told him I was actually coming to this lecture. And we were talking about nutrition, and he's a vegan. Um, and one of the things that he brought up that I thought was interesting was that people of color often think because like the system's working against them, they feel like, well, what's the point of eating healthy if like my life isn't, you know, if I'm going to be struggling. And I wanted to know if marketing towards junk food and marketing towards healthy food takes into account mental health at all of um, children of color. Well, that's an interesting question. Um, takes into account mental health of children. I think um, what, what marketing is trying to do is sell more of its product and put the company in a good light. If it would benefit the company to make that a feature, then maybe, but it's not really what marketing is about. Um, you know, I think that especially when you're talking about communities of color that, as your Uber driver said, have a, have a lot going on and, and oppression from a system that has a history that goes way back, um, it might seem um, futile. He, he was expressing to you some fatalism about that. I think if we counter marketing, we're countering one of the cogs in the wheels of oppression that are making communities unhealthy and not being able to say what they want in their own community, just like we talked about over here about whether there are too many outlets or not. So I think these things are connected and it's because we're living in kind of a fragmented world and a fragmented media environment in general, it's hard to see those connections. So really it's up to us to, to make them and articulate them and bring that history forward whenever we can. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Rosita Ileva. I'm Director of Food Policy Monitor also at the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Um, my question goes back to some of the slides at the beginning uh, of your presentation you showed um, and some of the avenues, product, place, promotion, um, price mm -hmm. um, that are used in the marketing of both healthy and unhealthy products. Uh, but I specifically um, would love to hear your thoughts about um, a joint up approach, right? Some policies um, may target the affordability, um, others the placement, mm -hmm. back to the land use question. Um, but if you were to focus only on a single um, say place, for example, we ban ads on television, sometimes um, it has been documented spike in brick and mortar um, stores uh, ads or social media ads. Um, and other channels. Um, so I wonder um, if you have any thoughts on um, what would it take for us to take a holistic approach uh, from a policy perspective in order to make sure that there aren't uh, overspill effects in other areas. Thank you. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, we saw the same thing in, in tobacco when ads came off TV, like Nick just described, the ads in women's magazines went way, way up and, and we saw an increase in smoking among women. So I, I don't know if uh, we can predict what that you know unintended consequence might be and we can't really dictate what other people do. We just have to get behind the thing we think is going to make the biggest difference and go for it and try to attract people to the work that we're doing. And I, that's what excites me about all the soda tax work. I really think we are on the cusp of something big and that when that gets in place, that can pour dollars into just the kind of uh, programs that we need to get people what they need in the face of too many jobs and not enough transportation and food that isn't as healthy as it should be close by their homes and all that kind of stuff that takes a lot of intricate work. So that's why I'm excited about that soda excise tax also because it can by itself reduce consumption. So you kind of get a double whammy. So that, you know, floats my boat. It might not float other people's boat. I think if we're all in conversation, if we're talking to each other, and if we have our eye on the big prize of creating healthy communities, it doesn't really matter to me which social determinant we enter on, as long as we're kind of facing all that direction together. Yeah. Hi, <clears throat> Hi Dr. Dorferman. Uh, Chris Palmetto, faculty here. 
Um, it's only my father calls me Dr. Dorsey. <laughs> I just want to reinforce the fact that you are a doctor, and you're, <laughs> you're so friendly, and we all know you as Lori, but um, you are Dr. Dorfman. So I want to ask your thoughts on strategies for reaching, framing messages to reach the other side of the aisle. Um, obviously, our politics have gotten even more polarized, and it's getting more difficult to appeal to people that are less likely to reach these. Now, uh, people have talked about Berkeley, the success of Berkeley, but clearly Berkeley leans so far left that it's maybe, you know, arguably easier to get something passed in Berkeley. But when you talk about framing messages to appeal to that right side of the spectrum, um, some of the things I've heard, it would be, you know, framing it as an economic growth uh, opportunity. Now, other people have said that's pivoting to the wrong frame. And, you know, Daniel Kahneman says money primes individualistic thinking. You know, those neural networks go off that way, and that's not a good idea. So I'm confused as to whether it's a good idea or not to, to talk about that frame or just get any other advice you have on how to appeal to Republicans, conservatives, et cetera, to these issues. So, you know, Chris, I went into public health because I want to make the world a better place, and I... I want to do that no matter who's in power. So it doesn't matter to me. I mean, it kind of matters to me. But it, it, I, I want to do it whoever is in power. And I think that there is enough that we have in common with each other that if we emphasize that, we get further. So I think what we have to do is talk in plain language and not be wonks and use jargon. I think we need to lead with our values and say why it matters to us to have a community that any child can grow up healthy in. And I think we have to be very clear and direct about the specific solution we're seeking. When I talk to advocates who, who do the electoral politics and who are really um, you know, talking with lawmakers, they often bring up the economic argument. It's not my favorite. And the reason it's not my favorite is because uh, I have two, two reasons. I don't, I'm not crazy about it. Um, one is that um, I don't, well, let me say something first. The first thing is, is that if, if you need to say that argument, I think say it, but get off of it as quickly as possible. And th the first reason I don't like it is because I don't think it, it works. If it did, we'd have prevention funded out the wazoo, right? It makes a, there's plenty of studies that show that we would save dollars and it's not funded. So that argument isn't working very well, number one. Number two, it's not our argument. We're not in this because it's expensive. We're in this because families and kids are hurting in real serious ways. People are losing their limbs. People are losing their life. That's why they're here. I want this even if it costs more. So. So for me personally, it's not an honest argument. I understand why people have to use it, and, and that's why I say they should pivot from it as, as quickly as they can. But I think if we say why this matters and we lead with that and we're direct about it and connect to the humanity in people that we're talking with, I think that's the path out. Time for two or three more questions. Question back. Yeah. Sylvia Perani from the Public Health Training Center at Columbia. Just had a question about what you think the role of local government, specifically health departments, is in all this. Is it supposed to oh, be I love that question. Code of tax or? Yeah. I, the question is, what's the role of local health departments? And um, let me uh, repeat something I said earlier when we were having a little conversation with um, students, and that is that people are often searching for what's innovative, right? What's the innovative way we can solve this problem? And I'm done with innovation. I shouldn't say that because that's a little too extreme. But, you know, I don't think what we need is a lot more innovation. I think what we need is scale. I think we don't know how to bring things to scale so that every community is healthy. Well, health departments are a perfect way to get to scale because they are in every community. So the question is, are they supported in the way that can let them do the work that isn't siloed, that gets to the social determinants of health, that connects with community and is driven by the communities that they're in? I think there's a lot that health departments can do that would improve their work and would improve their effect on health equity. But I, I think that's also an opportunity where we could really do a better job and where 
where we all come together, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on, the health department serves you. So I think we've got a good moral stance to say, here's the place in our society where we've said, we will pool some resources to be sure people are healthy. Let's just do it better. Let's do it better. Hi, my name's Latanya. I'm a current CUNY student here. Um, so I'm all for the, the tax on the soft drinks and the sodas. Um, but I want to play devil advocate to that. And I would say that as much as we are taxing, well, well potentially taxing all these soft drinks, Coca-Cola also owns companies like Dasani and Minute Maid that is filled with crazy amounts of sugar and sodium that also contribute to um, obesity and diabetes in anybody that consumes these drinks as well as obviously targeting um, communities of color, minority communities. And so um, also to that point is that as much as we're taxing these soft drinks, taxing a soft drink still doesn't make it any more affordable than let's say a naked smoothie that is available in the deli as well. When you tax a bottle of Coca-Cola, your total is probably going to be around $2.10, whereas the starting price for a bottle of naked smoothie is around $2.75. So nonetheless, it's still more expensive, especially for these communities, African-American communities and Hispanic communities. If you were comparing $2.10 to two, potentially $3 and some change, it's still not affordable. And so I'm intrigued to hear if you, if you have any thoughts on maybe, I don't know, there's like a tax credit possible for like healthier drinks. If I, I, I really, I personally don't have any ideas of that. Um, and then also the other thing that um, crossed my mind was that as much as there is um, anti, um, anti-marketing to the, to these companies and to these soft drinks, is, would it not make more sense to maybe do more healthy promotional marketing instead? So the same way that we're advertising in McDonald's companies where all these happy African-American babies are enjoying all their McChickens and stuff like that, why can't they also be enjoying um, apples and bananas and things like that? You see many non-Hispanic whites on Whole Foods commercials there's no African, not well, little to none African American presence there. McDonald's mm -hmm. definitely saw the market jumping in 2000, and that's because the idea of race and diversity was so open and engaged. But that was open and engaged because African Americans were speaking up in terms of police brutality and all these other things that we were experiencing at the time. And so they saw that as an opportunity to jump at our community, specifically with the fact of historically speaking, hundreds of years ago, hundreds of years ago, in the time of enslavement. Our, that's when our poor health started because we were forced to eat things that disproportionately started us off with poor health, like high blood pressure and diabetes, due to our food, due to our available food sources hundreds of years ago. So that started off our health potentially. That is a thought of what started off our health disparity from since hundreds of years ago. And now we're just being preyed upon instead of trying to be helped. Mm -hmm. So I'm just intrigued to hear any thoughts on those. Okay, well, you need to give the next lecture up here because there's a lot in that question. So let me just take a couple threads and pull them together. I think you're absolutely right to bring up history and enslavement. I think that we know from public health data and epidemiology that a population's health is determined not only by what happens to them in the world here and now, but what happened to their ancestors. So it's absolutely relevant. It makes the problem much more difficult. It also points us to focusing on the conditions that people live in here and now. And the idea that you raise that why not subsidize healthier foods and beverages at the same time you tax the unhealthy ones is a perfectly reasonable policy goal. And in fact, with SNAP or formerly known as food stamps, there are programs around the country that are doing just that, giving people more dollars when they spend them on, on whole foods and, and fruits and vegetables and things like that. So I think there's real possibilities there. The, the one thing that I would just caution about is that the soda tax is one strategy. There's a lot of different strategies and one strategy will never solve the whole problem as big and complex as this is. And just as it doesn't mean though that it's, a, it's not a good strategy to pursue. So just as an example, um, I'm just gonna guess based on my age and your age that I have been in airplanes where there was smoking, but you haven't ever been in an airplane where there's smoking. 
All right. They used to divide it. They used to have smoking on one side and not the other. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay. So that was a long time ago. That was a big fight. Thank you to the flight attendants who led that battle because it was their workplace. So they were affected more than anybody, just like smoking in bars, for example, workplace. So that didn't solve the whole tobacco problem, but it was an important part of that. It raised the issue so everybody could talk about it. They could visualize it. They could see part of the problem. It certainly helped those flight attendants. So it was a piece of the puzzle, not the whole puzzle. And I think the, the caution is, I don't want to get distracted because the, the thing that we're working on right now isn't going to solve everything. If I think it's on the path that's going to get us there, if it can link to others, you always have to assess and reassess these things. Sometimes you make mistakes and you change direction. But one thing isn't going to solve everything. But if you think it's worthwhile, if you think alongside the people who are trying to raise the price of unhealthy food that you want to work on lowering the price of healthy food, go to it. And one last question in the back, I believe. Hello, Dr. Um, Dorfman. My name is Sabrina Stevenson, and I am a first semester student in health in nutrition and hoping to go into happy. I understand marketing to be a colossal issue in the minority community. And listening to your, pre your presentation, I ponder the question if is marketing a successful method to target these um, restaurants for these people? Because within my community, we have a McDonald's, a Checkers, two Popeyes, two Kennedys, and the list goes on, and the cultural tailored restaurants within my community. But I think these people would still utilize these restaurants if there is an advertisement on healthy salads or, hey, we have a vegan veggie burger or the impossible burger. I think they would still do it because, one, that's what's accessible to them, and that's what they could afford. So do you think we should target them on preparing healthier foods, using more, using better ingredients, and also changing their menu overall. Do you think those are more effective methods rather than marketing? I don't think it's either or, but I think targeting the, the menu, the way you're describing, is a really useful thing to do. So for example, um, I'm not so crazy about McDonald's advertising salads when you put the dressing on and it's just as caloric as anything else on the menu and they're advertising the salad to get mom to say yes and brings in the rest of the family and who has all the you know the burgers and shakes and all that stuff so so i want it to be real i don't want it to be a token so that's one thing and one interesting thing to look at is the what the default menu is for example on kids meals if you go into a restaurant if you look at a kids meal at the, on the menu a lot of it's just junk, you know, and why is it junk? So I would say a great place to start would to be sure that the default menu for kids doesn't have soda on it, has milk or, um, or water, and has the kind of food that every child should be eating. So there's a lot you could do, I think, with structuring the menu of a restaurant that would certainly improve the health, especially since people are eating out a lot more than they used to. So uh, first of all, thank you to all of you for your wonderful questions and insights. Uh, it was really a great discussion and our uh, cumulative wisdom is greater now than it was when we all walked into the room. And second, thank you so much to You're you, welcome. Dr. Dork and Laurie, <laughs> for, your, uh, for your wonderful presentation and thought provoking. I'm sorry that some of you still have questions, but come on up and ask them uh, for the last few minutes. But we do have to be out of this room in a few minutes because there's a class meeting in here. Thank you all so much. <laughs>